I ended up uh, becoming a, basically a full-time prison guard for a couple of years. So for me, coming back to do my master's and now my PhD is, is a really quite a personal attempt to figure out how we can help people who are in crisis. At this point, we've put together one of the largest prison studies ever conducted in Canadian history. I do research on how uh, the opioid epidemic, and specifically fentanyl, impacts prisons across Western Canada. Prisons are consistently forgotten in any form of research, and this is really kind of ironic because within prison, fentanyl is a really massive concern, so much so that it's actually kind of restructuring the social fabric of what does it mean to be a prisoner. What we're doing right now doesn't work. Um, simply locking up people who have addiction issues. One of the things I, I hope to do through my research is potentially look at some solutions for this. My research and writing together are aimed at the production of Indigenous flourishing. So in my case, it means things like bringing attention to the lives of queer, trans, native youth and two-spirit youth, and also bridging the academic world and the literary world. My writing bridges the theoretical and the autobiographical. So how in that fusion can I communicate pretty complex theoretical ideas to those who would never sort of pick up an academic monograph. And so I'm interested in being a sort of gateway between the university and ordinary life. Building on the lessons learned about decolonization and the role of science and technology in the colonial project, I turned my eyes to thinking about the role of sex and the way in which um, the state, scientists and the church monitor and manage sexuality in the colonization of indigenous peoples and in the oppression and management of a lot of other peoples. The imposition of monogamy onto indigenous communities in the US and Canada, how that was coupled with a state sanctioned marriage. I definitely feel like my work has been shaped in positive ways by coming to Canada. Canada. And especially with regards to Indigenous knowledge production and cultural life, it's flourishing in Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba and the Prairie Provinces. This is a really amazing time for me to be as an Indigenous intellectual right now. So I'm really grateful to Trudeau for providing another kind of added uh, benefit to, to being in Canada. What these stories do is also talk about migration differently. I'm looking primarily at the contributions of African Canadians to the questions of human rights, uh, citizenship and belonging. And in particular, I'm looking at questions of what you might call the absent presence, the contributions that are invisible to broader Canadian narratives. Western Canadian stories often are missing from the broader stories about, about Canada and the, the broader stories about black life which tend to be dominated by stories from Ontario or Eastern, and Central and Eastern Canada. And I want to ask the question, why is there this gap? Why are questions uh, and, and the contributions of African Canadians largely left out of Canadian stories? And how those stories shape our understanding of citizenship and belonging in Canada? My research is based at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, where we're at essentially at the high energy frontier. It's like looking into the mind of God. We've just discovered the, the Higgs particle that you may have heard about in the, the news to, in 2012. And now, of course, is it all over? We think there are large questions around the standard model. For example, it doesn't explain gravity, but we think there's a deeper underlying theory. And that's what I'm doing now, looking for new physics. And I'm really happy for the recognition, but I'm even more pleased for the fact that the that basic research is being recognized. The search for fundamental knowledge, the, the, the urge to ask the big questions is being recognized by society. 